Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Dome at Home, the Manitoba Museum's Planetarium Weekly Astronomy Show. I'm your host, Scott Young, the Planetarium Astronomy Astronomer at the Manitoba Museum, and it's great to be back this week. We had a great show last week, lots of thought-provoking questions and some great mail that came in in between the, uh, the shows as well that we'll chat a little bit about. We are glad to have you here. I see some of our regulars are checking in. Please, if you're new to the show, uh, do tell us where you're watching from and how many people are watching. We like to keep track of sort of our audience and uh, make sure that we can either give you a shout out or make sure that our bosses see that we're reaching all these people. So we appreciate that. Great to see you folks. Just seeing all the names uh, pop in on the chat. With me as always, work in the background, producing the show and uh, moderating all the comments is uh, my colleague, Mike. Mike, how are you there? I'm pretty good, Scott. Yourself? You know, not too bad. Now I understand uh, you had a chance to see something pretty, uh, pretty impressive over the last uh, week or so that I missed. I wanted to tell us just a little bit about that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a rare one for sure. Uh, well, I'm sure many of our uh, listeners and viewers uh, Heard about the the great uh, auroral activity we had on uh, Thanksgiving night, uh, uh, Monday night, and uh, yeah, I managed to catch. Uh, I'm thinking probably the early parts of it. I know it got a little bit better uh, as the the evening wore on, but I still managed to catch uh, some spectacular uh, shots of it, and uh, it was great stuff. So uh, yeah, great nice. chance to see some. Yeah, we haven't had a display like that for quite a while. Um, I was, I, I was, uh, I had just set up the telescope in the backyard when I got the call from, uh, from Sean, who, uh, who we both work with at the museum, and um, he said, "Come on out to Birds Hill Park." And I had just set up a whole bunch of gear, and I was like, "No, I'll just, it's probably going to be nothing anyway. I'm not, not going to worry about it." And then, obviously, we had this amazing display. I was able to see a little curve of green just up above the houses in my suburban backyard. But um, this is a picture that Sean took. He uh, He's a great uh, Northern Lights photographer. Got some amazing shots of uh, of these brilliant Northern Lights that, uh, I mean, they were sort of forecast. We probably had 24 hours notice that they might happen. But with the Northern Lights, it's never a sure thing. So if you did get a chance to see it, good for you, congratulations. Try not to rub it in too much that I missed out on uh, what turns out to be probably the best display of the last number of years so far. Now, uh, this could happen again anytime. The sun is growing in activity, so I'm sure there'll be lots of opportunity for us to see other Northern Lights displays. But uh, if you sign up for one of those text uh, services that'll text you when the Northern Lights are coming, um, when you get the text, you should go because otherwise you'll be like me and just hear about it the next morning and be kicking yourself. Anyway, we can't all be full-time astronomers. All right, this show tonight is uh, a really good one. We've had this uh, topic requested quite a bit over the last little while, and we uh, finally got it on the schedule. We're gonna be talking about Pluto and the other dwarf planets. The other four dwarf planets, or eight dwarf planets, depending on who you ask. We'll get into that. But uh, we are going to be focusing on the dwarf planets tonight. We'll be taking a close-up look at all of them. But uh, before we do that, we'll um, also be taking a look at some of the things that uh, that will be happening up in the sky. So that's where we're going to start our program. Let us just pop over to good old Stellarium, our sky simulator here. This is the sky right now. Sun has just gone down, and uh, over in the southwest, we still have the brilliant planet Venus hanging around. It's the first thing you'll see at night, but you won't see it for long because it is low enough, and over in the west, it's starting to uh, starting to set very quickly. You might notice that if you catch it just at the right time, it's about 7.30, Venus is right next to another fairly bright object. This is the red star Antares in... Um, in Scorpio. And so it is a very bright red color. If you have binoculars, you can fit the both of them in the same field of view and you get a really good sense of the difference in colors because Venus is, is pretty much pure white, but Antares has this sort of ruddy orange color. And uh, you can definitely see the, the color differentiation there. By eight o'clock though, it's starting to get fully dark and Venus and Antares both set below the horizon. And so we miss out uh, if, if you're out by 8 o'clock, you've probably missed that, uh, that opportunity to see Venus. Despite it being October, 
we still have the summer triangle and the summer constellations hanging around. The, the summer triangle still dominates the southern sky. You got the big bright stars of uh, Vega and Altair and Deneb here forming a big giant pizza slice in the sky pretty much overhead in the early evening. Down low in the southern part of the sky, we have a bunch of solar system objects that are nice and bright. And tonight, they're nicely arranged. If you, uh, if you do get a chance to go outside, if it's clear where you are, I mean, I know it's raining here in southern Manitoba, but depending on where you are, you might have a better view. We've got uh, brilliant Jupiter, a little bit fainter off to the right is Saturn. And then tonight we have a moon that is just a little bit past half moon. So if we sort of zoom in a little bit there, you've got this pretty nice grouping, a little triangle of the three stars. The moon's only there tonight, of course. The moon moves on in its course around the planet every night. And so it doesn't linger more than one night near a, near a planet until it uh, comes around the next time. So tonight's a good chance for that. And uh, there's not a whole lot of bright stuff in that direction. I mean, the stars in the background behind Jupiter and Saturn, that's Capricorn the goat. I don't know how that's supposed to be a goat, but regardless, those are all pretty faint stars. And nearby Aquarius, not very bright either. So Jupiter and Saturn really jump out of that part of the sky. We will uh, spend more time later in the season talking a little bit more about constellations. I know sometimes we, we talk a lot about constellations. Sometimes we just sort of hit the highlights here. You can always find out what's up in the sky by visiting the Manitoba Museum's website. We have a special uh, what's up in the sky section in the planetarium section and uh, that'll tell you where the planets are any events like the moon passing a star and things like that all those kinds of things mike's put that into the chat and uh, you can always visit there and uh, we also have some star maps that are that we're adding to that um, program so it'll show you where the constellations are and so on okay there's a couple of uh, other events coming up that i want to sort of flag for you um, if you're going to be watching the sky. We're coming up to full moon. The moon is already half a uh, half moon in uh, about a week. It'll be full on Wednesday the 20th. And the night after that is the annual Orionid meteor shower. That's uh, Thursday, August 21st. You're not going to see much of it because the moon is going to be full. It's, it's kind of like having city lights that you can't drive away from lighting up the whole sky. The moon, when it's full, really makes it hard to see meteors or faint stars or deep sky objects or pretty much anything except the moon. If it's full moon, that's pretty much all you're gonna see. It certainly washes out aurora as well. So as we come up to full moon, we tend to uh, not look for the really faint stuff. We tend to look back to the brighter things, the planets and the moon and things like that. Um, we will talk a little bit more about meteor showers uh, in future shows because there are a couple of good ones coming up a little bit later on in the season, but you'll almost certainly in the next week see a bunch of things on social media some person will have you know looked up on the internet and found that there's a meteor shower and they know that astronomy stuff gets clicks on the internet so they'll put a post together about the orionid meteor shower and it could be 20 or 30 meteors per hour and they'll completely forget that this year the full moon will completely wash it out so don't be dissuaded by our by that i mean if you if you want to go outside lying up out under the full moon is a pretty pretty nice occupation anyway so you can uh, you can always go out you might see a few bright ones but if you really want to see a lot of meteors this is not the year for the orionids okay so our feature this year oh, this year our feature today is the dwarf planets and uh we this has been in the schedule for a few weeks and and we had uh some various questions come in a lot of people have been asking about pluto uh, other questions about the dwarf planets. Uh, Rowan was out there uh, asking some questions uh, and, uh, and their parents as well. Um, Melissa and Ryan were, uh, were asking about some of the dwarf planets and some of, the, some of the sort of detailed questions. We'll try to get to all those today. We're gonna start off just sort of going through what a dwarf planet is and what it isn't. Um, we all know what planets are, right? I mean, the earth is a planet and Jupiter is a planet, and Mercury is a planet. That actually doesn't really help us that much because those three objects are nothing alike. I mean, Mercury is a tiny little rock roasting close to the sun. Earth 
is where we live. It's got liquid oceans and air. Jupiter is a gigantic world with no solid surface, totally made of clouds, surrounded by 80 moons. It's, it's, the word planet is very, very vague. And that just got worse when we started looking at other things like Pluto. Pluto sticks out even farther from the other planets than the planets do from each other. So the word planet was in trouble for a while. So let's, uh, oh, we got a question about uh, the screen being smaller. Hmm, there's nothing changed on our end, so you might need to just uh, play around uh, with your own settings there. At least I think there's nothing different on our end. It looks the same here. Um, so we'll go to the very first planet, dwarf planet, that was discovered. It was not thought to be a dwarf planet at the time. In fact, it was thought to be a planet. And it was called a full-fledged planet. Some of you might be thinking of Pluto, but in fact, we're going to go back even beyond Pluto, all the way back to the night of January the 1st, 1801. Yeah, that's right. New Year's Day, just after midnight, on the first day of the new century, essentially. And there was an astronomer out there looking for planets. Obviously, he didn't get invited to the right parties. So, um, he discovered an object that was very, very small. It didn't look like a planet. In fact, it just looked like a tiny little star, but it was moving. And by looking at the, mo the motion, they could calculate that it was between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. It was given the name Ceres, and it was announced as a full-fledged planet. Now, this actually happened... This, it would have been the eighth planet because this is before Pluto was discovered. It's even before Neptune was discovered. So Ceres was actually the eighth planet ever discovered. Very quickly, though, they realized that Ceres wasn't the same as the other planets. First of all, it was very small. You couldn't see any discernible size to it, even with the largest telescopes. It still just looked like a dot. And it wasn't by itself because only a month later, another object was discovered in the space between Mars and Jupiter. And then another one, and then another one. By 1850, dozens of these objects had been discovered in the gap between Mars and Jupiter. And at that point, astronomers realized, okay, obviously, these things can't all be planets. They're all way too small. And they're all packed into this little area. A planet is like one big thing all by itself with maybe some moons, but it Usually there aren't more, more than one planet in the same orbit. So poor Ceres and some of the other objects were demoted from planet status and they were now called asteroids or minor planets. Minor planet is, that, is the uh, sort of preferred designation because it notes the fact that they are planetary, they go around the sun, but they are very minor in size. The word asteroid actually means star-like and of course, they're nothing to do with stars. They just look like stars through telescopes when we didn't have very good telescopes. So anyway, minor planet is the best term for it. We'll come back to Ceres. But Ceres was the first planet to be stripped of its title. So Pluto isn't even the first one. It's, uh, it's the second one. Actually, I guess about the fifth one because uh, a bunch of the other asteroids were called planets at that point. Anyway, we'll come back to that. Fast forward 130 years to 1930 and the planet Pluto. Pluto, discovered by Clyde Tombaugh um, in 1930. He was looking for planet X. He found Pluto. And so the assumption was, well, Pluto must be planet X, the next planet out past Neptune. Neptune had been discovered in the interim there in, uh, I think it was 1840. So we've got Pluto, but Pluto never quite fit in as a planet, but we didn't really know what else to call it. It obviously wasn't an asteroid because all the asteroids were between Mars and Jupiter. Well, most of them were anyway. Nothing was way out there past Neptune. So Pluto, well, it's a planet. We'll call it that for now. We discovered that it had a moon. And actually when we sent uh, more detailed uh, imaging towards it, we were able to find out that Pluto actually has five moons and it has an atmosphere sometimes. And it has all sorts of sort of geological forms on it made of ice that is so cold that it is hard as rock. Really, really interesting world. So this is, um, you know, leading up into the, 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 the modern age of astronomy. 
Pluto's been around there for a while, it's a, it's a planet, we start discovering other objects out past Neptune. Now, as you might imagine, things way out at the ragged edge of the solar system, way out there, they're really faint. And if they're small objects to begin with, they're, they're small and they're faint, they're just really, really hard to find. And so it takes a lot of work to track these things down. But finally, astronomers start finding, oh, here's some of, uh, I forgot I had this slide, this is, here's some of Pluto's uh, smaller moons, way, way smaller. So you've got basically Pluto, then you've got Charon, which is about a third the size, and then you've got these tiny little bits of gravel almost uh, going around it. We discovered uh, Quawar in 2002. Quawar is an object out past Neptune. It's small, smaller than Pluto, but it's kind of in the same space as Pluto. It's out past Neptune, and interestingly, uh, and this was what, one of Rowan's questions actually, interestingly, it does sort of this gravitational dance with the planet Neptune. The way gravity works, everything pulls on everything else. And it turns out that if you get things going in a sort of a regular pattern, things can sort of tug on each other in such a way that they sort of sync up. And so what happens is um, Quawar and Pluto go around the sun twice for every time that Neptune goes around the sun three times. So their orbits are kind of linked like that. And it's because of the gravity has sort of tugged these things way out there in the solar system at the edge. The sun's gravity is pretty weak. So if you come close to another object, like a planet or something like that, it can really have a, a big effect on it. So the planet Pluto and the planet Neptune are kind of doing this little dance around the sun. And um, Quawar is in a similar kind of dance. In fact, there's a bunch of objects out there past Neptune that are in this, it's called gravitational resonance. So it's interesting to sort of think that Neptune is really affecting what's going on out there. But anyway, we had we had Pluto, we have Quawar out there. Okay, so maybe, maybe Quawar is like a, a little Pluto. So we called it a Plutino. That's actually still my favorite name for things, not dwarf planet or any of that stuff. Plutino is just a, a cool name. So Quawar was one of the first Plutinos. And here's an artist's uh, rendition of what Quawar might look like. It's actually kind of reddish colored. It's quite dark for, uh, for um, something that's made out of ice. And it has a tiny little moon that goes around it. So again, asteroids don't normally have moons, so we thought. And so it's planets that have moons. So is Quawar a planet? Well, in 2002, the jury was still out. Then we discover in 2003, another object called Orcus, out in the same area, has the same kind of gravitational resonance with Neptune, uh, has a moon. We're starting to see that Pluto is not unique in terms of its place in the solar system or what it looks like. There's a whole bunch of these little Pluto-like objects out there. Then we find Haumea. Haumea is, uh, I think it was 2004. Let me just check that. Uh, 2005, my mistake. Uh, 2004. Haumea, out there in the same area of the solar system. It's actually in a, an even stranger orbit. It is not in the same kind of resonance with Neptune, but it has two moons. And not only does it have two moons, and uh, so here's sort of a, an image of like time lapse of, of the moons. We can barely detect them and you can kind of figure out how they're, how they're going around the planet. But because of the moons, using some math, we can work out how big Haumea is and so on. And by watching how it changes in brightness, we can work out its shape. Haumea is actually shaped like an egg. And not only does it have two moons, it has a set of rings. Okay, we've never seen an asteroid with rings before. We've never seen a minor planet with rings. The only thing that has rings are the big planets. So what are these things? Right around this time, there's a lot of people that are sort of saying, okay, we've got to, we've got to come up with better definitions here. We can't just call all these things planets because then there'd be too many of them. They're obviously not all the same. We got to start, you know, breaking things down. Now, I've always been a fan of the idea that, okay, you take things that are kind of the same and you give them the same name. So, you know, you've got the rocky planets, Earth, Mercury, Venus, Mars. 
You've got the gas giant planets, the big ones with all the rings and moons. You've got Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And then you've got these other little things, the dwarf planets. That would be fine. Um, that's not what people did. Astronomers came up with this very complicated definition of what a dwarf planet would be. First of all, a dwarf planet is not a planet. I don't know why it uses the word planet then, but regardless. So dwarf planets are not planets. They have to be above a certain size so that they um, are big enough that gravity can sort of squish them into a round shape. So how may I hear this big egg-shaped thing? That wouldn't qualify as a dwarf planet under this definition. Even though it has moons and rings, it's not even a dwarf planet. There are a few other um, categories and descriptions as well, but it's still a vague uh, system. In fact, to this day, astronomers cannot agree on how many dwarf planets we currently know of. We'll come back to that in a minute. But right around this point, things are starting to look bad for Pluto because either all these things get to be planets too or Pluto maybe doesn't belong as a major planet. This is the one that really puts the, uh, the nail in the coffin as it, as it were. Um, Eris is discovered in 2005, also has a satellite. The thing about Eris is um, based on its brightness, it looks like it's bigger than Pluto. So we couldn't even say, well, okay, Pluto's still going to stay a planet because it's the biggest object out there at the edge of the solar system. Now it's second biggest. This is really the, the object discovery that sort of um, demoted Pluto, pretty much. In fact, Mike Brown, the leader of the team of, that discovered Eris, um, has put on his resume that he's the guy that killed Pluto. So that's his, uh, that's his view of it. Here's a, an artist's rendition. It turns out... Eris is not bigger than Pluto if you use diameter. The brightness of an object, it's based on its size, but also what it's made out of. And it turns out that Eris is made out of almost perfectly reflective white snow. It's not dirty or red like the other ones. It's perfectly white, so it looked bigger than it was. So it's actually about 50 kilometers smaller than Pluto, but it is heavier than Pluto. It's denser, so even though it's a little smaller, it weighs more. So is it bigger or smaller than Pluto? It depends on how you draw your lines. But Eris in 2005, that was when basically the, the International Astronomical Union decided, okay, we need to define things. And they came up with this definition of what a dwarf planet was. It, it had to be able to be, make itself round. It had to be able to clear its, uh, a real planet clears its orbit of, of small objects. And so it's kind of by itself in its orbital space and, and a few other things like that. And so they said, so now we have five dwarf planets. We have Pluto, Ceres, the, the biggest asteroid. Um, we have um, Eris, we have Orcus, and we have Haumea. Well, wait a minute, Haumea doesn't fit that definition really either. And anyway, there were a whole bunch of problems with this. A lot of scientists latched on to those inconsistencies in the definition, definition and sort of started cry, crying foul. The public got involved because someone put out a press release that says, NASA says Pluto isn't a planet. Um, NASA has nothing to do with it, of course. NASA flies rockets, but nobody knows who the International Astronomical Union is. So in the spirit of the internet, somebody just made something up and it went viral and everything was um, a huge mess. And you got school kids protesting and things like that with little signs, Pluto is a planet and so on. Big kind of mess. And it was not handled very well by most of the astronomers involved. It does though kind of show people how science works. I mean, we all grew up knowing Pluto was a planet. Well, sorry, if you're older than about 16, you grew up knowing Pluto was a planet. And we don't want to change that. Most of us don't have any reason they don't want to change that. It's not like most of us are not planetary geologists or, or um, you know, statisticians or any career that would give us any insight into whether Pluto really belongs on the planet list or not. It's just we learned it as a, kid, as a kid and we don't want to change. So there's a big emotional attachment um, that, that is behind this. But this is the way science works. We learn more stuff. Sometimes the ideas we used to have need to get changed a bit. And it's not like we're saying, okay, Pluto is, is not a planet. It's a, 
ice cream cone. I mean, we're not we're not, not making a huge change. We're basically just saying Pluto is a kind of planet called a dwarf planet, and it fits in with these other things here. But again, if you walk out onto the street and you ask people, do you think Pluto is a planet or not? They will argue with you. People are mad about this. Still, it's crazy how, uh, how much emotion this generates. Meanwhile, after the definition, we start discovering more and more of these objects out past Neptune. This is uh, Makemake, uh, which is um, another object, a trans-Neptunian object, out past, um, past uh, the um, edge of the solar, or at the edge of the solar system, has a moon. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, I, ju I just saw a couple of, uh, a couple of questions here. Um, ben was asking, uh, these Plutinos, were they discovered from a Hawaiian observatory? So yeah, the, uh, the Gemini uh, North Telescope, which is on the island of Hawaii, was involved in some of them. Um, and there's a whole bunch of observatories in Hawaii. So many of, the, many of the observations were made from there. Most of the images I'm showing are follow-up observations with the Hubble Space Telescope, which gives a better view. Um, although interesting, Makemake is actually the name of, uh, I believe it's a Hawaiian deity sort of chosen in honor of the fact that, you know, a lot of this astronomy gets done from Hawaii. So um, Makemake, uh, smaller than Pluto, has a moon, um, very, very dark in color. So it's actually very sort of uh, reddish brown, almost brick colored. And so it's much fainter than its size would make a make us uh, believe. So it was a lot harder to spot. So here are the biggest objects out there at the edge of the solar system as of last year. Um, we've got Pluto with its five satellites, definitely a dwarf planet. We've got Eris and its single moon, Dysnomia, also a dwarf planet. We've got Haumea, with its two moons and its set of rings, maybe not a dwarf planet. Now, because of its elongated size here. Now it turns out that we think Haumea is made of a different kind of material that isn't as strong. And so the rotation of it is actually sort of stretching it out more than if it was made of the same things as the other dwarf planets. So kind of hard to say. Um, we've got Makemake with its little moon that doesn't even have an official name yet. It's just called MK2 as sort of a shorthand. Then there's, uh, here's an object that we didn't talk about. Um, for a long time, this didn't even have an official name, just a number until they were able to sort of pin down its orbit and figure out about it. Uh, it's called Gong Gong with uh, its, its little moon Zhanglu. Kwawar has a little moon called Weiwat. We've got Sedna which is um, a small object, one of the only ones that doesn't have a moon. So it's kind of an oddity in terms of these uh, trans-Neptunian objects. We've got Orcus with its big moon, Vanth. Uh, we've got Silesia and Actia. This one was only discovered a couple years ago. And this is the kind of designation. I'll have to move my head. 2002 MS4. That's what these things get named when they're discovered. Because we discover so many objects in the sky that they don't all get named right away. They just get a serial number, and then people observe that object with the serial number for weeks, months, sometimes years, before the International Astronomical Union eventually says, yeah, this we know enough about this to give it a name, and then it gets a name. Where are we going to draw the line here and say, okay, all the ones on this side of the line are dwarf planets, and all the ones on the other side are not dwarf planets? I'm sure there will be arguments about it. Whoever discovers each of these probably has a stake in the game as well as, uh, as, well as all the different uh, astronomers that are trying to figure this out. But it doesn't really matter. I think what, what's kind of cool about these dwarf planets, it tells us um, that the solar system is not as simple as we thought it was. It's not just what you learned about in grade six with the sun and some planets and then some asteroids and comets. It's actually a whole swath of material that ranges from the sun, this giant star, to Jupiter, this giant planet, all the way down in size and in composition, down to tiny, tiny little pieces of dust. So it's pretty interesting that, you know, we're very, 
uh, what's the word? We're very hung up on what we call things. You know, our language is important. Science needs to have precise definitions so everybody knows what we're talking about. But the solar system doesn't care about that. I mean, what's the difference between Eris and Pluto, functionally speaking? Nothing. They're, they're the same kind of thing. Why would we call them different objects? The same thing with Eris and Quawar. They're pretty much the same thing, just Quawar is about half as big. We can find objects all the way down in the asteroid belt um, and in the, the Kuiper belt out there past Neptune that just are the same thing, just smaller and smaller and smaller. So I'm sure lots of people will fight about the names, will fight about all the details, but really what it comes down to is the way we classify the solar system is much less important than the way the solar system actually is. And it is much more complicated and much more wonderful and much, much more varied and um, interesting than we ever imagined. And the dwarf planets particularly, and this is actually, this is something that Melissa sent, said in her email to me uh, yesterday, that these little objects might actually offer more um, value to science than the big planets. Because the big planets, they're all kind of relatively similar. Like if you look at the gas giant planets, sure, they're slightly different in size and so on, but they're kind of the same thing. When you look at these, these little things, these dwarf planets, there's so much variety and there's so much um, subtle differences between them. They may tell us more about how the solar system was formed and how things came to be. One of the things they certainly tell us is that there used to be more dwarf planets, for sure. Here's, uh, here's Gong Gong. This is the best image we have of it. It is so far away. It literally is just a few pixels. Here's a piece of art to sort of show. Again, it's got that red color. What's making these things that are made out of ice red? Well, we think maybe there's dust that is piling up on the, on the snow. Maybe they're going through the dust from other objects and other collisions. Maybe the sun, as weak as it is out at that distance, is sort of tanning the surface and making it darker. One of the questions that uh, we often get, well, you know, Pluto goes around the sun and sometimes it's closer to the sun than Neptune. It's in a weird orbit. Well, here's our solar, so oh, keep hitting my mouse wheel. Here's our solar system. The earth is way in the center there. The sun, of course, right in the middle. Um, you can't even see the inner planets. They're so close together. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. This pink one out here is Pluto. You see how it sort of crosses the orbit of Neptune and then goes out like this. So that's one of the reasons that we sort of said it never fit in as a planet. Well, look at some of these dwarf planets. 2007 QR10, that was the old name for Gong Gong. So this is Gong Gong's orbit. It goes way out, like three times as far away as Pluto. Here's Eris in a big oval orbit as well. And actually, if we look at these from the side, they're all tilted compared to the solar system as well. Here's the way the most of the planets go around. Here is the tilt of Pluto, which we thought was extreme. Here's the tilt of Eris. It's almost, it's almost going around up, up, like, um, up and down instead of side to side. So the solar system is a very complicated, very intricate uh, system. And um, it's not just Neptune and Pluto that are dancing together with gravity. All of these things affect the, gr the grav are affected by all of these other objects. And um, especially out there in the in the reaches of the solar system, two objects that pass by each other, their orbits can change. There's a lot of change going on right at the same time. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, looks like there's a bunch of questions. Do you want to uh, you want to pull out uh, any of the questions there, Mike? Yeah. Hi, Scott. Um, yeah, the the conversation on Facebook and YouTube uh, has been uh, quite animated. People are loving this topic as we knew they would. Uh, right off the bat, uh, Danielle uh, says that her son uh, Ben loves dwarf planets. Uh, this uh, topic is perfect for him. He knows everything about them. So happy to uh, to see that interest in uh, in our solar system. Uh, lots of people commenting on their new favorite dwarf planet. Uh, Tiffany loves Quarwar. Uh, she thinks that it yeah. sounds like an evil alien overlord. So um, Absolutely. Can't, 
can't disagree with that. Uh, somebody else has put Haumea up there as their new favorite. Uh, but questions, yeah. Uh, Brad on Facebook wondering, uh, does Charon uh, revolve around Pluto or do they both spin around a central point in space? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, we sort of think that little things go around big things, so moons go around planets. That's mostly true, but in the case of Pluto and, and Charon, the moon is so big compared to the pl to Pluto that it's actually almost more like a double planet. They do revolve around a point that is not inside Pluto. It's in between the two of them. And so um, the two of them are revolving around this sort of empty point, which is the, the center of mass of the, of the system. And uh, that's fairly rare. In our case, like in the moon's case, for example, the moon go and the Earth do go around a central point that is not the center of the Earth, but it's still inside the Earth. So the Earth sort of wiggles around a little bit, but it doesn't actually move around a point that's outside it. So um, even with our moon, which is pretty big compared to our planet, that, that center point is still inside the, the larger body. With Pluto, they're actually orbiting around this, this empty point in space. Um, uh, Michelle yeah, go was ahead. wondering, and I, I think she's uh, made a mistake in her question here, so I'm going to correct her. Uh, she was commenting that the rings around Haumea, because it is Haumea that has rings around it, uh, were they observed or are they inferred through, uh, say, an observation process like occultation? Yeah, actually, the, that's a really good point. Uh, the rings of Haumea were discovered when Haumea passed in front of a distant star, and they were hoping to be able to measure its um, its shape by observing where on the Earth the star got eclipsed from and where it didn't. But the places that were way far out also recorded a little bit of an eclipse, and, and from that they were able to infer that there must be a ring of material going around the asteroid. And uh, the same kind of thing has happened to help discover some of the moons. I forget which ones, maybe not of the dwarf planets, but it turns out that many asteroids also now have satellites that we know about. And some of those were discovered when that that object just happened to go in front of a star and, uh, and block it out. And those kinds of observations are made by amateur astronomers, people in their backyards with small telescopes. So it's, it's pretty amazing to think that, you know, with your, your telescope in your backyard, with a stopwatch, you could actually measure an asteroid at the edge of the solar system and measure its size and figure out if it has rings or a moon with, with just a, a tiny little telescope. Yeah, it's, it's always amazing now we're able to, to determine all this information. Uh, there's lots of questions. We're probably going to have to go onto the, the Facebook and YouTube chat and, and answer these after the show because I know you've still got some content to cover, but I, I just want to cover a really interesting comment from Melissa on uh, Zoom, uh, who has pointed out that uh, that uh, graphic you showed of all the different orbits of the planets and dwarf planets around the sun looks very much like an atom. Uh, and when we are looking at those oh, orbital yeah. pathways, it's an interesting comparison, wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's... Um... You know, you, you, there is a simulation. I'll try and dig it up for next week, but it, it basically simulates where all the asteroids are in the solar system compared to the planets. And it's just this swirling cloud of material going in all directions. Uh, we think that the solar system is nicely ordered and, and so on, but it really is this sort of swarm. And that's pretty much what you see when, you, when you're able to sort of uh, visualize what an atom is like as well with the electrons and so on. It's... Uh, you know, people wonder, is the solar system like an atom in the universe? Is, is are atoms their own solar systems? There's this, this whole science fiction thread that goes down that way too. So, okay. Uh, yeah, I will, uh, I will pop into the chat after the show and answer any questions that we missed, but I do want to move on a little bit here because it is time for cool space stuff. <laughs> Okay, so remember last year we had all the spacecraft going to Mars last summer, and there was uh, there was a Chinese probe, and there was the, uh, the the Curiosity rover, and then there was the Al Hamal Al Amal spacecraft from the United Arab Emirates, and they released one picture, and then we didn't hear anything from them. Well, they started releasing more pictures, and this is a great shot of Mars taken from their uh, their Al Amal orbiter 
which shows sort of the crescent of of Mars rather than that big red thing that you sort of normally see this really focuses on the atmosphere because the Sun is sort of off the bottom of the picture and it's sort of backlighting the clouds and you can see that it's there's sort of a bluish sky there with with bluish white clouds not that dissimilar to the kinds of things that uh, that we have here on the earth uh, when I saw this picture it really struck me how similar Mars and the earth are when it comes right down to it I mean there's enough difference obviously that we can't live on Mars and all the water went away and like there's this you know only a tiny little change has made our two planets completely different but they really are very very similar and, and seeing this picture was just a, a a real vibrant reminder of that um, Al Amal is the first um, spacecraft from the United Arab Emirates and I'm super glad that they are getting some great pictures back because that's the kind of of information that's the kind of thing that you know if you do it it's expensive and if it fails you tend to maybe not do it again but they've been using it to uh, to really spur some of their education and outreach and, and stuff like that so really cool all right uh, speaking of asteroids uh, launching in two days is the Lucy spacecraft Lucy is going to fly off and visit a record eight asteroids a couple of years ago we had the Dawn spacecraft it went to Ceres orbited for a little while then it went on to Vesta another asteroid orbited a little while and, and we got sort of a comparison of those two worlds Lucy is going to go out to a, a more distant asteroid group and visit eight of them and we're really going to get some detailed compare and contrast and, and see um, what these little worlds are like asteroids are fascinating they're left over from the formation of the solar system they're also the kind of thing that you know Hollywood movies have taught us are very very dangerous I mean asteroids hit planets they cause lots of damage it doesn't happen very often but uh, you know the dinosaurs probably were finished off by an asteroid and um, we'd rather not be finished off by an asteroid so the more we know about asteroids the safer our civilization is so I'm looking forward to uh, to following that one there's gonna be it's gonna be one of those missions where they launch and then nothing happens for a bunch of months as it flies through space and then there'll be a whole bunch of pictures from the first asteroid and then nothing as it goes off to the next one so it's gonna be something that uh, is sort of a slow burn but we're gonna learn lots about the asteroids from the Lucy spacecraft and we couldn't not talk about this yes Captain Kirk went into space um, the uh, Blue Origin spacecraft had its second human spaceflight launch the first one was with Jeff Bezos and his brother and uh, a few other people um, this one they gave Captain Kirk a free ride because they knew the marketing value of having William Shatner fly into space on your rocket and they were right it was all over the place excuse me um, the longest part of the flight was walking up the seven flights of stairs to the top of the rocket so that they could get in the whole flight lasts less than 10 minutes three minutes of weightlessness but even that I mean hearing William Shatner come down um, he was actually really really moved by the experience and uh, you know having played a starship captain for 50 years he uh, he certainly um, came he was he was pretty eloquent about about how it changed him and he, how he, he he hoped he would never get over the experience of seeing the earth all fragile and and uh, and so on so it was pretty cool to watch Mike did you watch the uh, did you watch the launcher I watched it from launch to landing I was absolutely yeah. thinking it was the coolest thing I'd seen I of course you know as you've said and you know I'm a big Star Trek fan so to see William yeah. Shatner uh, get to experience that at 90 years old, uh, I mean, I couldn't help but be uh, uh, impressed, and uh, I enjoyed watching him go up there. Yeah, for sure. And now he's the oldest person to have ever gone into space. So uh, we'll see if that record holds. Um, on the first flight of Blue Origins a few months ago, um, uh, uh, Wally, oh, I forget her last name. Um, she was 82 and she went up into space and before that John Glenn went up in in his 80s as well but uh, we'll have to see as some of these folks uh, buy tickets on this very expensive uh, flight we'll we'll see who goes up next but it certainly generated interest and I'd, of all the people that I'd like to shoot into space I mean I think William Shatner's probably high on the list there that was Wally Funk that went up Wally Funk thank you yes thank you very much my memory is going yeah it was 
it was awesome to watch. Thank, yeah, thanks everyone. It was uh, it was uh, great to watch. There's there's um, going to be more of them, of course. And uh, both of these companies, uh, both uh, Blue Origin and SpaceX, who's launching their own stuff, um, and then also Virgin Galactic, I guess. They're very good about doing stuff live. So if you sign up to their email list, you'll get to watch these things. And it, it is cool to see not the big NASA launches, but kind of like a home-built spacecraft almost, it feels like. They're, they're doing it very uh, very simply and very elegantly, and it's, it's neat to watch these things go into space. So I highly recommend uh, checking those out. Okay, we have uh, just a couple of minutes here to finish up our amazing uh, show for the week. Um, George was helping me do a little bit more image processing last week. So uh, I got another shot of him working away on the computer. He, uh, he did manage to, um, when, you, when you go out with a telescope, you take a whole bunch of pictures and then when you bring them in, they all have to get processed. So you, you, you sort of set the process going and then you walk away because it takes sometimes an hour or two to, to load all the files and process them and add them and correct them and blah, blah, blah. Um, George likes to walk on the keyboard while that's happening so that it usually trashes the thing and he, he has deleted at least one set of files for me. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite pleased that he's become so active in my astronomical career. But uh, anyway, he says hi. Any, uh, any other questions that we have before we uh, wrap up for the, this, this evening? Uh, yeah, maybe we'll just take one quick question. Uh, uh, Hollis, our friend Hollis from uh, Connecticut uh, asks, oh, hi, uh, Hollis. Uh, notice that all of these uh, trans-Neptunian objects, these planets, dwarf planets, all have moons that are named, uh, but ours is just called the moon. Does it, Did it ever or does it have a name? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the moon is sort of the English translation. Um, I mean, in Latin, it's called Luna and... Um, so, I mean, there's there's a bunch of different words for it, but basically they're all just words that mean the moon. Back when language was being invented, there was just the one moon. And so there was no thought that you would need to s distinguish. It's like, it's, it's like why our planet is called the Earth. It's like our planet is called dirt because it's made of dirt and we walk on it. It, it, does, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, except that when the names were picked, there were no other planets. There was no conception that there was anything beyond. Now that we get all this, our language is inadequate for what we are doing. And so we have to give these moons names. I mean, you could you could just call them, you know, moon A of this object or, or whatever, but giving them a name seems to give them a, a bit of a personality and, and so on. And so, you know, we had to expand our language kind of the same way we had to expand the the concept of the term planet as we discovered more and more different kinds of planets. So um, astronomers have never been good at naming things though, I have to say. That's, uh, that's always been a little bit of a problem. Okay, um, as always, we love to hear from you. So if you have any questions or ideas for shows, we would love to, uh, to see uh, or hear from you. And uh, I can put up the links here. You can always drop us a, a line, get us through Facebook, YouTube, uh, space at manitobamuseum.ca. And uh, we will be back next week with another show. Um, and next week we will be talking about, and I have to jump back to my memory aid here. Mercury. Ne Mercury, yes, thank you. We will be featuring the elusive planet Mercury. Uh, it's the closest planet to the sun. It's always hard to see. This is going to be our best chance of the year coming up to see it. It means getting up in the morning, though. But I'm sure some of you will be up to it. So we'll talk about that next week. And we'll also update on all the other cool space stuff that's been going on. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And love to see you uh, here again next, uh, next week. I hope you get out there, get a chance to see some things in the sky. Maybe we'll get some great northern lights. Um, but if not, there's always something going on. So keep looking up and we'll see you next week.